Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know. What time are we, are we supposed to be? Is there a time that we're... Five minutes late. I'm, I'm five minutes late. Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, yes, we're, well, we're sort of like not quite sure about, um, you know, like, I mean, how we could, how we should sort of like uh, set up this little discussion thing here. But one of the things that uh, we've, we decided was that perhaps we might gather some ideas. It is in the internet and the Pacific, and the Pacific. So we thought we might if get some, um, some ideas from the floor that we might be able to discuss. We've just been having a very interesting discussion at the back um, in relation to domain names following on from the, the last um, uh, session we just attended and um, domain names in the, in the Pacific and how they're actually managed and, uh, in, the, in the various ways. But um, is there an issue or is there something that um, people want to talk about that they, um, is, they feel is an issue within the Pacific that needs some discussion, some further discussion? Oh, well, would you like to put it on the board? So everyone can sort of like, Don, would you like to put your issue on the board? Um, what, just one at a time would be good. Sure. You don't like my handwriting? Oh, well, I can read it much easier from here than back there. <laughs> Anyone else? Do I need to explain that? Yes, you will. I will, but later. Okay, let's start from, we should start from the top, you know, usual. Um, well, starting from the top, let's first of all um, introduce ourselves, seeing as we're a nice little group here. Um, okay, I'm Maureen Hilliard. I'm um, temporarily facilitating this, um, this session. I was sort of hoping that we'd um, have some of our other team here. But, um, so I'm Maureen Hilliard and I'm on, on, on the board and I'd like to quickly go around and so you, can know, so you know who you've got here. Yeah, Ian Thompson, uh, used to work with SPC as the ICT Outreach. I work with USP now about e-learning. Uh, I'm Janine Eastwood. I'm just from, I'm from Squiz, but I'm just here on my own recognizance today. Hi, I'm Martin Darren from the Ministry for Culture and Heritage in Wellington. I'm uh, Save Vodea from ICANN, and I'm a Pacific Islander, uh, Fiji-born. Uh, David Morrison, um, the Head of Marketing for the .NZ Registry. 
Tailor for Love. I'm Sonia from Newmarket School. I'm a primary school teacher with an interest in Pacific being Samoan. Hi, I'm Shuri. I'm from Fiji. I'm representing the private sector, but mostly as a tourism technology. Hi, I'm Daniel Griggs. I'm from Registry Services New Zealand. Same company as David. <laughs> I'm Duarte, a um, member of Picasso. I'm Kasek Galgal with the uh, University of Papua New Guinea. I'm also a Papua New Guinean. Thank you. I'm Brian Louis Gang. I recently spent a couple of years in the Pacific on telecommunications regulatory issues, but here today I'm just a private interested individual. Uh, I'm Navi from uh, Fiji, uh, representing the operator from Fiji. I'm Kara Hill, a recent graduate of Inspiral Dev Academy in Wellington. Um, Olivia Badley, also a recent graduate from Inspiral Dev Academy. Uh, Malo Lele, I'm Mediana Tongapia from the Alexander Turnbull Library, and I'm also the president of the Pacific Information Management Network. Hi, I'm Kara Sefawiva. I'm the Regional Coordinator for Computers and Homes in Auckland under 2020 Communications Trust. I'm Don Hollander and I've got a bookshop in Wellington. And ex um, General Manager of APTLD. Oh, Kia ora, I'm Mark Osborne from Core Education. Tom from Wireless Nation. Oh, uh, Frank Williams from Install Broadcasting, Digital Signage. Sorry. Yes, Akai Manoa from University of South Pacific, Silver Fiji. Well, thank you very much because what it does, it gives us an overview of um, the, you know, the wide range of um, people we've got here and who can um, contribute to the discussion points which have actually been um, put up at the moment. The first one was actually raised by Ian. So, um, Ian, would you like to sort of like... So, it comes both from the uh, Pacific Islands ICT ministers meeting that was held in Tonga last month, but also at that meeting there was a launch by the Pacific Regional Infrastructure Organisation run by the World Bank. Uh, and that report highlighted the social and economic benefits of ICT in the region. And uh, for those of you who are on the, on the Pick ISOC listserv, you'll see that I've re referenced that before, but uh, an interesting conclusion that they came to was that we seem to be doing relatively okay about rolling out infrastructure. So for example, of the 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, I've, I've counted 14 of them, are connected to submarine fibre cables. So the infrastructure is going there, we're getting better coverage, we're getting cheaper prices and things like that, but they're saying they don't see much evidence of things like um, effectively using the infrastructure to improve business services. Particularly this is true for governments, saying they're not really using ICTs to transform and improve their delivery service mechanisms. So their conclusion is, amongst other things, um, there's still more work to do in effect getting the value out of the stuff that we've already done. And, and I just wanted to raise that as an issue to say, um, as members of the Pacific Internet Society group, what would be our response to that? And, and I know there'll be other responses as well, but I just want to say, what role do you think that PAC-INET would play in that role? And I think it comes down to that, what's the future of PAC-INET as well? well? I think there's something interesting to talk about there. Uh, thank you. So, um, Don, probably f from your addition then, um, you know, as um, Ian's saying that, uh, you know, what we've actually got at the moment isn't being used effectively. So, why do we need more? So it's Don Hollander here. So I think, um, Ian, you, you noted that there are many capital cities that are connected uh, to fiber. And 
there's lots of areas that are not connected uh, through fiber because of the nature of the of the Pacific. There's just a lot of islands with a lot of water. Uh, so I think that there needs to be more uh, more infrastructure, both within the the landmass where the fiber lands, but also the rest of the the community that uh, is even more remote. So that's why I uh, I think that there is a need for more uh, using it using it better using it more uh, very useful. Uh, there is fiber, for example, into American Samoa and it, which with another sublink to Samoa, but that's a very old fiber. It has a cap maximum capacity of one gigabit, and it's well and truly oversubscribed uh, before before even start. So uh, there needs to be additional infrastructure, whether it's fiber or O3B or the new Pacifica, K-band, whatever, uh, and also within the within the islands themselves. So I think, Don, that there's a lot of stuff happening in, in those areas. For example, a number of telcos are now, with the help of the World Bank and Asia Development Bank, looking at universal access programs. And, and, I, and I think they're valuable and they must continue and we must do a lot more. Um, and there's still a gap between what's happening in the universal access area and what's happening in the capital city. Uh, there's still some a lot, of, a lot of stuff to do in there. But, but I think um, just, just flagging an issue to say, please don't only focus on the infrastructure. It's important, we've got to get it there, but we've got to use it well as well. Um, one of the discussions that we've actually had sort of like over the last couple of days has been um, the lack of, of um, you know, infrastructure, or infrastructure goes to a certain, yes, for, to a certain level and then the, um, the service doesn't sort of progress, so we're actually sort of like using it properly. And I think, in uh, case I'm going to have to haul you into this discussion, um, a prime case is the fact that we, you know, for example, on our board, we have two members from the um, <coughs> of the board from Papua New Guinea who can't even connect on using can't use Skype to um, to join our meetings, and the, the Skype continually drops off. So. Uh, we were actually discussing this earlier this morning about some of the, some of the um, the issues. Um, Kasich, can you just um, perhaps explain some of those issues? Uh, yeah, in uh, PNG con connectivity is still a bit of an issue, and it's mainly the main centres that are connected to the internet, and still then um, the reliability of that connection is still a bit of an issue and probably I'd say the main issue is probably the cost. Internet costs are quite high in uh, PNG. So I would say and uh, let's say broadband, most Papuanikas will probably use the internet, uh, probably using 3G LTE in, uh, in uh, the house but uh, at homes but uh, fiber connection to homes still non-existent, <laughs> if I may, at, at the, mm. so uh, probably if those, uh, your, your board, board members who are having issues connecting uh, via Skype, if they're using a, a mobile device or some uh, 3G to connect and the coverage isn't that good, you can understand how it could, uh, the, they could fall off every now and again, mm. so. Yeah, and um, I think going back to what you were saying, um, uh, Don, that um, just better connectivity within the country is uh, is uh, something that can be, even though there are uh, cables into PNG, but getting uh, better connectivity within the country is uh, very important at the at the moment. Thank you. Are there any other? Um um, there are other issues that is related to your uh, question, and most of this is uh, related to um, what is available. 
uh, for example, if, is there funds that is available to be able to uh, better use the infrastructure? Um, we have the fiber in place and we have the connectivity, but then um, is there people that is skillful enough to do this sort of work? Um, do we have the funds to be able to pay the skilled people to do this? I mean, it's a really complicated issue. And <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to answer what most people see as the most pressing problem is, is their funds, um, the World Bank is saying, we've invested in this infrastructure and we're not getting good return on it, we, we will invest in getting better return as well. So if we can come up with proposals, there are donors out there that will support them because they, they see that they, they've not completed the job yet. So the World Bank in particular and the Asia Development Bank are saying this is our next step. So we've been doing a lot of infrastructure stuff, now we're moving on to using. The other issue is about the capacity to do these, you know, to, to put forward a proposal to the World Bank that they will approve. And, and I think we need to do some capacity building in that area as well, particularly with government officials to say, how do you build a proposal here? How do you, how do you build a proposal that is acceptable to the World Bank to do this? And I think there's, a, there's some stuff that we're talking about now about putting in place some capacity building uh, programs that would help government departments generate an e-government proposal that will be acceptable to the World Bank. Maybe this is a, uh, a topic for later, but um, and stop me if you want to make this a topic for later, but um, I know how to program and I grew up in a white middle class household and I think I'm the pro the uh, the product of my privilege in that regard but um, and so I have done quite a lot of volunteer work with um, helping other people who didn't have access to that privilege to to learn how to use the internet to become programmers to become uh, people who can leverage that infrastructure that they've been given or that has, has been made available um, and learned how to use it to express themselves and to enrich the communities and to en literally enrich themselves. Um, so I was very heartened when I talked to Ian earlier um, to hear that there were volunteer organisations who were um, working to actually um, teach people how to be programmers and to leverage that infrastructure. And I'd be really interested later in talking to anybody who um, who either knows of any of those programs that I can volunteer for or, or help support because uh, I think that it's incumbent on all of us to help each other um, to be better, better users and, and uh, have access to, to using that infrastructure. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to add um, in between times is that there's actually, you know, um, when, when you consider the millions of dollars that has actually gone into capacity building and that within the Pacific, um, I think that, you know, that whole, you know, the, the area of capacity building is, you know, it's something that really, really need to look at is, you know, like, it's like it's gone into a big hole. Except, except, you know, we get people like Etowati and others who actually have just gone that, you know, have gone that little bit further and doing something, um, you know. And but there's a lot of money that's been invested in capacity building. But as Ian said, how to construct, how to learn how to construct that business case and how to access those services and how to access that collective um, uh, resource would be, um, would be very helpful indeed. I think there's been a lot of sort of like grassroots stuff and I think that's fine. It's actually the high level development sort of like side of things as well. Sorry, um, can, can we just go back to your, to your question? Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Etuati. 
Um, what Maureen is saying is true. I mean, um, it's not that we should try and uh, use the infra infrastructure in a better way. Uh, we should also try and idealize what is already in the islands. Um, in most Pacific island countries, they tend to um, get uh, expatriate to do their work. But um, I don't think that is the case. They should change the mentality in the sense that what is local, use it. It might be cheaper, but at least um, uh, there is capacity building, and at the same time, they achieve what is it that they wanted to do. I think there's some really important lessons to learn from all the capacity building that has been put into the Pacific. And uh, some of the, the, the learnings that we're getting is that taking someone out of a, a department or a, a job situation and bringing them over to some other place and giving them training and then putting them back into that environment again generally results in very little change. So what we need to be focusing on is how do we get things to change. It's not just building capacity, but it's change. So we're thinking about building in a change management program with the capacity building. So getting the team of people in the government department that looks after, say, passports. Let's get the whole team together. Let's get some of the local people that are there as well, the, the, the technical experts. Let's get the, uh, the, the donor community in there. Let's run a workshop for a couple of days and let's then do some online training as well together so that we can together develop a business case that we can all implement instead of flying in the guy from overseas and implementing something that's not sustainable and falls over in three months' time. So there, there's some really interesting stuff that we've learned out of what we've been doing in the past and we don't want to repeat those, those ones again. Yeah. I'm going to put you out of a job now, aren't I? <laughs> So mine's a bit of a follow-on to that. Um, I think, um, sorry, I feel a lot of the time uh, with these uh, interventions that come in either from non-governmental or from governmental interventions from outside the organisations, it seems like they come in, they do a project, and then they leave. Um, so my question is, on a more sustainable side, um, there have been also commercial interventions as well, specifically about Digicel, uh, and I haven't seen the results of Digicel moving into the Pacific. The last time I went to a PACNOG was when they were really starting to push into there. Um, so I'm just curious about the feedback as to whether or not people are seeing Digicel as improving the infrastructure in the islands or whether they are taking advantage of the resources there and exploiting them. <laughs> it could be, a, it's, a, it's a balance. So. Just in, in response to that, um, Digicel has a certain reputation, not just in the Pacific, but also in the Caribbean, uh, where they started, and it's not particularly complimentary. But the fact is that there aren't that many other companies out there that will go into these situations and build a network and try to run a business. And certainly there are examples where, yes, they do seem to be taking advantage of a... Um, their market leadership position. But again, if they weren't there, then the services wouldn't be there at all. And the quick statement to that is they are looking to create a sustainable change in those organisations, uh, in those countries, even if it's for profit. And is that necessarily so bad? Exactly that. I mean, the, the World Bank is pushing the opening up of uh, the telecommunications industries to competition. And that inherently means that they have to be able to make a profit. So you can't have one without the other. You've got to take the good with the bad. Um, Sakayo, do you have anything to add in relation to this, um, the, the question about capacity building and that because it's actually quite important as part in your role? You might have to tell people what you're doing. <laughs> yes, uh, Maureen, I think the issues that we, we're talking about here, it's, it's an ongoing issue. And the thing is, like, we've been telling, like, the countries, uh, take, for instance, the case of Fiji. They've got their e-government their e e working. It's, perf it's working perfectly fine. You know? And the countries are still developing their own. So we've been talking to them, look, why don't you send people to Fiji or ask the Fiji government to assist you in this regard. 
But this, this is what we, we, we are saying. We, we've been telling them over and over again, look, we've got Fiji case and Vanuatu is just developing their e-government initiative. The Fiji government one is working perfectly fine. People who used to come to Suva to do their passports in like three, two or three years ago, they're now just going to a center in sorry, spend a week there with their relatives and then they head back to their, their relatives. But, but it's, it's something that we've been telling people, the countries, look, the other case is the case of Kiribati. They've developed their universal access uh, plan and said, look, why don't you just talk to Vanuatu, who has done a, a fantastic job with their UAP. And they, they didn't realize that Vanuatu has one. So it, it, it appears that people are, uh, countries are working in silos. So it, 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 it's a pro problem that we're facing in, in, in the Pacific. So we need to get our, our acts together and start acting like a, a Pacific region. So it's Don. Thanks for, very much for that. And I've I've seen that for most of the century uh, around the region. And and I just wonder if there's not the opportunity, not so much to reinvent the wheel, because you're saying the wheel has been rein, reinvented time and time and time again. So it's clearly not efficient in the short term, but by having so many new wheel inventors spread throughout the region, don't we get over the long term far more people with skills and abilities in the long term to be able to do additional work? So I'll just give you one quick example. When I went to Samoa, uh, turn of the century, there were about 50 people who made their living in IT. And IT was principally centered for government IT was principally centered within Treasury. And the government made a decision that each government department would have their own IT operation. Very inefficient. But two years later, there were several hundred people who made their living in IT. And they were weaning themselves off of contracted experts. So it took time. But there, are, and, and I haven't done a recent census in Samoa, but I suspect there are many hundreds of people now in Samoa who make their living, at least partly, through their IT, IT skills. So inefficient in the short term, but perhaps providing real world capacity building uh, experience in the longer term. I, I don't know what, I don't think it's a, it's a right or wrong answer. But it's just maybe explaining why people like Fiji uh, developed their own voter registration system, even though Samoa had developed one several years before with fingerprint technology for identification. But Fiji said, no, no, we're not going to. All right. So there's just ability for people to, yeah, from the outside, it doesn't look clever. But from the inside, it might be very clever with a long-term perspective. Thank you, Don. Um, I think, too, that um, one of the things that um, Sakayo has raised, and it, I think um, I didn't go to the ICT minister's meeting, but I, from, from what I read of it, um, was that you know, it's that lack of coordination that we don't have within the, uh, within the Pacific. But, um, Skyo, you know, like, I mean, there is there is an opportunity for more cooperation and coordination for this sort of thing using the crop. Could you explain what the crop is and what the advantages could be of the crop developing? <laughs> I know. Um, I'm just putting it on the spot. Um, you know, because I mean, it's our one, you know, regular meeting organisation that could actually make a difference in the, in the Pacific. Um, yeah, I'm talking mainly. Yeah, I think come over here. The crop ICT yeah, unit, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the the crop is is actually it's an acronym. I think it's the Council for Regional Organization, organization. of the Pacific. So it actually made up of regional organizations based around the Pacific region. 
So, for instance, like we have SPREP in Samoa, we have the foreign fisheries agencies in Honiara, we have the uh, Pacific Community SPC, which is based in Suva, with, together with the University of Seattle Pacific and the Pacific Forum, uh, yeah, P Pacific Island Forum, uh, which is also based in Suva. So, what happens is that they, they have a number of uh, crop uh, bodies which look after different. Uh, so I say interests. For instance, they have the one for the energy, transport. They have one for the climate change. And there's one specifically for ICT, which is called the Crop ICT Working Group, which uh, I am part of. Ian is also part of that. And what happens is that we inv send in, uh, invitations to all these regional organizations around the Pacific, plus other bodies like the uh, ITU, ICANN, uh, UNSCAP, to be part of the, uh, pick ISOC of course, to be part of the crop agency. The idea was to, to allow, uh, to be as open uh, as possible so that we get uh, ideas of how we can actually develop ICT in the region. So yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously for the last two years it's been very quiet, but since it was Crop the, the ICT functions of the Pacific used to be with under SPC, but for, for the last two years, it has been transferred from SPC to USB. So for the last two years, it has been quiet. But just beginning of last last year or the middle of last year, when we came on board with another uh, employee, employee, so the 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 the, the body uh, the the agency, the working group, begin to come back to life. So now we, we actually in the process, like uh, on, uh, my presentation, we actually, according to what was agreed at the ICT ministers meeting, was to the crop agency or the, the working group to look into developing a framework that will allow the establishment of a regional uh, data repository, which is one of the, the issues that we highlighted in the review of the ICT framework. We, in, the, in the Pacific region, we don't have that. And it was a, a big problem for us, getting the, the responses or the data to allow us to determine what was actually working in, in, in the Pacific in terms of the development of ICT. So th th that's mainly the function of the, the crop ICT working group. And I'm, I'm happy to say that we, we will send an invitation to PKSOC to join. Thank you. Um, one of the things, though, um, I did note earlier, CROP also included um, uh, countries, like I know that Australia and New Zealand were actually included, um, as well as other Pacific, um, you know, the key Pacific um, nations. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, if we're, for, for the CROP, because you're actually looking at initiatives within the Pacific, that having... Um, Representation from those governments who are usually the donor company, the donor countries, um, would actually be of any benefit to actually call them back in again. Well, the the, the process is it's uh, they we have focal points for Australia and New Zealand based in in Suva. So whatever we decide in terms of like what comes out of the crop working group, we pass those outcomes to these focal points. So whether they will do anything about it. So I give you a clear. Uh, I'll give you an example. As the, the the review of the ICT framework, we send the review to all of the focal points like Australia, New Zealand, and all, all the other organisations like uh, ICANN, uh, ITU, UNSCAP. So they they are all part of the the, the process. So whether they respond to that uh, call, it, it's nothing much I can do. But it's it's as of now. The only country that, that came back to us was, I think, was New Zealand. You obviously didn't nag enough. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, it's really interesting things we started on infrastructure, and we've actually sort of like gone a little bit beyond that. Is there another topic that we can perhaps move on to following on from the sorts of discussions that we've had, had just of late? Is anyone, would anyone like to sort of like add something? Oh. Um. Now that we have discussed the issues, um, going back to your question, what can PKISOC do to improve things? Oh, 
<laughs> oh, thank you for that one. Um, I, I guess at this particular point in time, it's sort of um, because this isn't a, like I mean, this isn't just pick ISOC. This is a so like a you know a, an everybody meeting, and we'd all we'd like you all to join pick ISOC if you you know if, you, if you're interested. But um, I think that what you're getting at probably is something that needs to so let me take them back to our members, you know, and we can we can raise those things. But it's sort of like, what can we do within the Pacific region to actually sort of like make a difference in the in the way of the internet? Um, do, should we do you want to raise some of those the discussion, like for example, the discussion we were having before about about dot fi, dot Fiji <laughs> dot fj. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Cherie. Um from Fiji, and uh, we were part of the domain discussion that was just done a while ago, and um, um, it was very interesting to hear about the .nz, like the nethui.nz uh, domain name that was registered, and people in this dis in the that discussion were asked about whether they had a .nz for themselves, and a lot of people put their hands up, and um, for me, I realized I could have a shuri.nz, but I, why don't I have a shuri.fj? I mean. <laughs> And uh, we started a discussion, a few of us at the back there, about uh, what uh, what we can do to get something like that. And um, the, uh, the answer that we got was that uh, it's USB is our main registrar, and uh, USB uh, um, dot, to get a dot .fj, so Shri dot .fj, would mean that uh, more and more people would have to be interested in having their own dot .fj. Uh, uh, domains for USB to say, okay, let's go down this road for a .fj. And uh, um, I guess why Maureen's asked me about that is because uh, I were wondering whether that's something that uh, PKISOC could take up uh, on our people in this forum about, you know, we want to have a .fj. Um, is there somebody here that can help me get a Shuri.fj? And how can you help me get a Shuri.fj? And uh, what do I need to do to get a Shuri.fj? <laughs> Well, I think um, Savi might be able to contribute to that discussion. I think uh, <coughs> Savi was there from my camp, but what I'm thinking that you're trying to get it is the registration at the second level for the TLD. Like for country code top level domains, uh, op operators and registries and managers, um, it's really entirely up to them. Uh, they have a policy setting body and they, they look at how they can open up that space. So I'm, I'm sure that in New Zealand, like the DNC probably had done that and um, they opened up the, the second level for registrations. So in many of the Pacific Island countries, some of them have outsourced their functions to other registry backend and their policies would be set up by either themselves or the other backend providers that they work together to open up that uh, second level. But in, for Fiji's case in particular, I would, as I was saying, like maybe perhaps they haven't had uh, demands from uh, the local uh, registrants who register under the, at the third level to, to, to talk to USB, who is the registry, if uh, they can open up at the second level. So that's, for them, it's a, it's a policy decision that they have to make. Uh, then again, I, uh, as, as the local community for Fijians, uh, you need to talk to the registry because then they will either open up or not. Can I just add to that? Um, I didn't know that I could get a Shuri.fj until I sat here and heard about the .nz one. And I'm sure that people in Fiji, if they heard that they could get um, an address like that for themselves and for their companies, I'm sure the big companies in Fiji would be very much interested in getting a .fj for their own companies. And it's, it's just a matter of uh, um, maybe USB needs to provide people in Fiji with that option. I'm speaking to anybody in USB here. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further on that, Savi? Sakaya? Oh, hang on, you need the... Yeah, I just want to uh, say a few things about what it, what it was actually, the question that he was uh, actually giving to the floor. I think it's it's important that, you know, Peak ISOC is in the Pacific, and we have a, a working group that is already functioning, it's working. It's, it's important that we come together as a group and work in, in collaboration with each other. If, if, you, if you try and, and, and do something like out of the, the working group, then you, we, we, again, we come back to the step one, which is we're working in silos. 
So it's important, like how we we're going to move from move on from here. We look, we've, we've already got the, the, the action plan which has been endorsed by the ICT ministers meeting in, in Tonga last month. Why don't we use that as, as a benchmark in which we can actually take the development of ICT in the region to another level? If we try and invent, reinvent the wheel, it's, we, we will come back with the same problem. What was something in the action plan, therefore, that was like on top? What is something that would be achievable um, through through you know peak ISOC um, involvement, and I'm I'm thinking that when we're talking peak ISOC, we're talking about 600 members that we actually keep in touch with, um, and these 600 members are across the you know the Pacific in at, at, in the majority of the 22 countries that are in the Pacific. So their outreach, the, their ability to outreach into their communities is actually very broad. We've got a we've got the the mainstay for that um, for that influence within the Pacific. But the only thing is that um, they're just individual in, they're just indiv individual end users. Many of them um, don't belong to ICT groups or anything like that. Their main contact with an IT community is on the email list and connect, connecting with the with the other members. So, um, you know, if we're looking at ICT ministers saying they've got, you know, to having an action plan um, and that, you know, we might have representation at the crop meetings and so that we can contribute the concerns that are raised by PICOTSOC members were from the email list because it's the only way in which we can communicate with each other. Um, you know, like, what is something that is that we could be working on um, from that ICT ministers meeting that is that would be something that would be achievable for us? Sakai, oh, any, anyone. Um, it would be great if um, all the crop and Picasso work together to, let's say, that uh, what you are requesting can be done, you know, uh, to make it more powerful, you know, like one organization that can um, influence USB to, to, uh, to achieve what is it that the, the users of .fj uh, requested. I mean, that would be great if, if one day we can do that. Dot .fj just to start with and then every other country will be able, will be able to do the same. So, so this is not an answer to the question, but it puts it in context saying that the crop agencies are intergovernmental agencies. Mm. So they've got official status and they, they have a, a good way of interacting with people. Uh, ISOC, pick ISOC, comes from the grassroots. Mm. You can raise issues, but then it's very difficult for you to do anything with them. Mm. So if you feed them into that process, it seems like a really good thing to do. Mm. And, and when it comes to the question you said, what can we do, my answer is, go read the, the framework, and go read the documents, and come back to us and tell us what you'd like to do. Um, I'm, you know, that's, that's, that's your value contribution. So just let us know and we can work through these issues. Just like to say two things. One to Cherie. I've just come from the session on online activism and so I would say get going. <laughs> Put pressure on. Whether it goes through pick a sock or not, um, that might be a way to actually gauge the level of interest out there, not just for Fiji, but also for other countries in the Pacific. With all this um, enthusiasm about getting all of the Pacific Island countries to cooperate, I, I think it's worthwhile to uh, be a, inject a little bit of realism. Um, the two... <coughs> areas that I know of geographically around the world that have tried to get individual countries to cooperate regionally are in the Caribbean and in Europe. And well, we know that in Europe it's taken many, many decades to get to the stage that, that they've got to and they still have an awful long way to go. And in the Caribbean my knowledge is, is not that great but I know in terms of telecommunications they have what looks initially to be an overarching regional telecommunications regulator, ECTEL. 
but you don't have to look too deep to know that um, it's, it's not a regulator, it's an advisory body. So they make recommendations and each individual country in the Caribbean, and not all of the countries in the Caribbean belong to it, then decide whether to accept those, those regulations. So while we can sit here and say, well, it, it's obvious that they should cooperate in the Pacific, the fact of the matter is human nature, geopolitical aspects or whatever, um, it, it is difficult to do so. You need to take your time over, over doing it um, and just don't expect instant results. Mind you, if you get instant results, that's fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Does anyone else want to have the, like the last word? We've just heard that monkey-sounding bird thing. Um, so, you know, yeah, we've got, we've got, got a minute or two for, um, for some other comments. I thought it would be quite interesting to hear from someone perhaps who's not in the, in the Pacific um, to sort of like get, gauge some, um, some um, idea of some perspective of what it is that they're hearing and like does it make sense or heck what are you guys doing? Anything? Cool. Hi. Tom from Wireless Nation again. In fact, I have never been to the Pacific Islands, so my apology. <laughs> I'll be there soon. Oh, good. Um, yes, um, actually, in New Zealand, we, we provide the internet service to the remote areas via the satellite. And uh, I know that Pacific has been um, promoting for KA band satellite into the countries. And um, I just want to say that uh, uh, from our perspective, in fact, we receive a lot of inquiries from the islands saying, can you come and do the um, satellite that you are offering in New Zealand, you know, for my motels or hotels and stuff like that all the time. And we normally say that, sorry, we haven't got the service there just yet. Um, from our perspective, really, um, we, we don't really understand how to how to go and operate the service there. Uh, for, for example, I'm actually really interested, but I just don't know how. Uh, for example, I also know that um, over here at the moment, for example, we are trying to uh, resolve the problem with the black spots, um, mobile black spots, and uh, we have a new technology called small cell, which can have a coverage of up to about 5K stretch, and you can get, you can operate 4G, uh, 4G, yes, so 3G slash LTE, um, using the um, satellite as a mobile backhaul. So effectively, you can drop these low-cost cell phone network into any part of the country, and then you will have instant coverage. And then if you have a good deal with mobile operator and as well as the service, service provider in the area, you can effectively have mobile service for the voice communication plus the data on top. So it means that you might be able to have like really low cost data plans, um, you know, um, offer immediately. And, 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 and that, uh, I mean, for example, like the, for the Pacific Island, perhaps we can have a gateway in New Zealand, so internet gateway over here or, or in Australia. And then we can then use the very wide satellite footprint using KU band or KA band, and then we can just beam down to the different islands and that you can have the alternative redundant cellular slash a wireless architecture uh, you know, network immediately. It is possible and it is actually quite cost effective. And that it is really new. It is 2014 slash 2015 technology. So it is available out there. Uh, even in New Zealand, it is really new to us and that we are, we are really trying to convince the regulators and mobile operators that it is a way to go. It has been done in Japan. Uh, they deploy over 4,000 cell sites like that. And then after that, the tsunami hit. And then they see the real advantage of why they need to have such a network. And, and, and over there, all the satellite bandwidth just saturated instantly because the, the government issued a mandate saying that you must have such networks immediately available for all the islands in Japan. Uh, otherwise, what is going to happen when there is an earthquake like that again and that which is going to disrupt all the terrestrial communication. Right. So I just want to say that from our perspective, 
uh, in New Zealand, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, innovative operators who are interested to participate in solving the problem in the Pacific because we are the neighbors. Um, it, it's just a matter of how do we really work together because we actually don't know. For example, I have no idea how to get there, right? How to operate the service there. And uh, can we get the license there? Do we need the license to operate the service? Maybe not, maybe yes. Who knows? Yes, yes, Sorry. yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that because it actually just did raise um, several things, which I'm sure Sakayo was listening really intently to, um, and so that we can actually offer that benefit for across the Pacific. Um, thank you. I haven't heard the screaming, um, but I'm, it's going to be starting soon. I do thank you very much for your um, participation. It's been really interesting. I've been jotting down some notes, and um, I really do appreciate that you've been here today and to to um to talk to us about the pacific thank you